how are we as leaders, HR leaders or any leader, actually going to understand the journey our people have been on? So you have to be, you know, more than ever, that compassionate listener, more than ever, that compassionate, uh, empathy-driven leader. At Heart Talk HR, we bring you fresh ideas and inspiring content from around the world of work. It is my absolute pleasure to uh, to continue with the Heart Talk HR, another interview. And because as you know, in life, you only need uh, two things, uh, duct tape and a can of WD-40. If it's loose, but shouldn't be loose, use the duct tape. And if it's not loose, but should be loose, then you need to use WD-40. So the legendary chairman and CEO of WD-40, uh, Gary Ridge, will be here with us. Uh, Gary, good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Did you hear my introduction? What we need in I life? did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Fantastic. And I'm so happy and so thrilled and privileged having you here because you are an ultimate living role model of an inclusive leader. And, and, I, and I really, the, the culture of WD40 is absolutely phenomenal. I know that when you became a CEO, your engagement level was somewhat around 50 percent ish. And now it has grown to like 90, over 90 percent. So that's something every organization uh, wish to have, that they can see that we have over 90 percent of engagement level and people love working for WD40. But it's not by accident. And I invited you to come on, uh, come on the show because you've written an article. And it's not an article, it's an essay I printed out, Leadership Lessons for the Lockdown. And ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, visit uh, Gary's profile on LinkedIn, you'll find this article. I really recommend you to download it, print it, and give a copy to every single leader in your organization. Because those, this, I don't know how long it took for you this, uh, to write this article, but the wisdom and, 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 and the depth, it certainly comes from your uh, 20 plus years as a CEO as exemplary leader. So thank you so much for writing it and thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, let me ask, when you were not always an inclusive, empathetic and caring leader, were you? Um, I, probably not as aware of it as I should have been, but you know, when I got the opportunity to lead WD-40 company back in uh, 1997, um, we were about less than a quarter of the size we are now and most of our business was in the United States. And, and we had a dream and the dream was to take the blue and yellow can with a little red top to the world. What became very clear to me then was micromanagement was not scalable. We were not going to do that. So we needed to create a place where people went to work every day. They made a contribution to something bigger than themselves. They learned something new they were protected and set free by a compelling set of values and they went home happy. And fortunately, I went back to school. I went to the University of San Diego. I did a master's degree in leadership there. That's where I met my now dear friend, mentor, co-author, Ken Blanchard, the one minute manager. And during that process, I really uh, learned the power of servant leadership. And I thought that was the way to go. I learned the three most important words I've ever learned in my life, and they are, I don't know. And I got very comfortable with those three words, I don't know. So I think I was somewhat inclusive, but going through that learning opportunity really gave me the confidence to implement a, a servant leadership style through our company. And that's why today we have 93% employee engagement and 98% of our people globally say they love to tell people they work at WD-40 company. And we operate now in 176 countries around the world. Hmm. And you know, what's, what's, what's fascinating is that we talk about a lot, we talk a lot about during this conference and many age of conferences I attended, always a conversation comes up. Uh, when, how, how to get HR, to have HR have a, a seat at the table, how to convince business leaders, show them data so they will listen. But you have a very different approach. You, you say it's all about people. Correct. Aristotle, who was born in 384 BC, 
made a great statement. Pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. We're just very slow learners. And I think it's very obvious that if we as leaders can create this culture where people enjoy what they're doing and they're treated with respect and dignity, the work that they do will be better than if they're disengaged. You know, I would, I don't know how leaders have led through COVID with low employee engagement. You know, we know that 67% of people who go to work every day are disengaged. Right now, they're not disengaged, they're dramatically disengaged. And, um, you know, we've been drawing down on our uh, cultural equity for the last nine or 10 months. And um, if we hadn't have had that, I don't think we would have had the resilience that we have now. We would, you know, at, at we, you, as you know, we call ourselves a tribe, not a team. And, and what is our promise? A group of people who come together to protect and feed each other. And that's what we've been doing. You know, back in March when this corona roller coaster um, became part of our life, we had three objectives. The number one objective was the safety and the well-being of our people. The number two objective was to stay connected with and service our customers. And the number three objective was to make sure that we maintained the business infrastructure so that we would thrive when we came out of this. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. Before we jump on the leadership lessons for the lockdown and recovery, I probably, some of our listeners have not followed WD40 as closely as I, as myself have. Can you just uh, give us some insights about the core uh, elements of your culture and, and how you lead the organization? Yeah, firstly is purpose. What's our purpose in the organization? And our purpose, our, our just cause is to make life better at work and at home. That's what our just cause is. And that applies to the people who, who are tribe members at WD40 and the people we serve as customers. So we want to make life better at work and at home. Our, our purpose is we exist to create positive, lasting memories, solving problems in factories, homes and workshops around the world. We solve problems and we create opportunities. We're in the memories business. The next thing is having a clear set of defined values. I have an algorithm for culture. Culture equals values plus behavior times consistency. So what does that mean? You have to have a set of values that both protect and set people free. The leaders, and we don't have managers in our company. Everyone is a coach. We call, we're, we're coaches. We're there to help people win. So a leader or a coach has to be brave enough and love their people enough to not only applaud great behavior, but redirect behavior that needs to be redirected that's not in line with what's happening in the organization. You know, leadership is a balance between being tough-minded and tender-hearted. And then you have to do it consistently. This is simple, not easy, and time is not your friend. You have to do it consistently. And then, of course, we don't make mistakes at WD-40 Company. We have learning moments. And why do we call learning moments learning moments? Because the learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. You know, people don't like admitting failure. So why would we put a system in place where we're looking for failure? Let's look for learning. And organizations that will thrive into the future are those that are agile learners. And we've been a learning organization for many, many, many years. Our brand was based on learning when you think about it. We're called WD40 because there were 39 formulas that didn't work and the 40th one worked. So it stands for water displacement 40th formula. So thank goodness they didn't give up at 39 because we wouldn't be having this conversation today. <laughs> Probably. And you also have a, a term for for those uh, leaders who are not necessarily the most people-oriented, the soul-sucking CEOs. <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, I call him Al, the soul-sucking CEO or the soul-sucking leader. Right. And these are leaders who have behaviors that suck the soul out of people. For example, they don't involve their people. They must always be right. You know, they, you, they don't keep their word. You know, they're not dependable. Uh, they think they're corporate royalty. You know, they're not inclusive. But most importantly, and here's where it comes down, their ego eats their empathy 
instead of their empathy eating their ego. It's all about empathy, about being able to understand the feelings of others. The ego-driven leader is Al, the soul-sucking CEO. Mm. It's very interesting because on the other end, this question is what we are promoting in an organization. Very often, uh, ego-driven people are driven most of performance, so they perform, therefore they get promoted, and then we end up in, in trouble. How, how, how does it work in your organization? Again, it works that we have a commitment that it's all about the people. Um, you know, if you were to look at our organization, if you went to our website and our careers page, the first thing you that really comes out at you is our values. And if our, our number one value is we value doing the right thing, our number two value is we value creating positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships. So it's really important where the, at the job of the coach, and it's the book I wrote with Ken Blanchard, which is called Helping People Win at Work. Our motto is we're not here to mark your paper. We're here to help you get an A. So a coach is someone who doesn't run on the playing field. They spend their time on the sideline. They're in the locker room listening to the team, identifying ways to win. And most importantly, when the team wins, the coach never, ever goes to the podium. The, the victory, the glory, the applause is for the team because profit, is the applause of people doing great work. So if we're there as organizations to create an economic engine to support the people we work for, and the way we do that is to be profitable, our job as leaders is to help people do great work because it's the great work. And of course you have to have a clear strategy and you have to have good execution. But if you were to think about the will of the people, Let's think about the will of the people. Let's say, or, or let's call the will of the people employee engagement. Let's say that you have an employee engagement of 30. And you, or, or let's say, I'll make it the math easy. Let's say it's 10. And your strategy score is 50. 10 times 50 is 500. But let's say you had the will of the people or an engagement of 80 and a strategy score of 50. 80 times 50 is 4,000. You know, Drucker said culture eats strategy for breakfast. I believe a great culture makes breakfast a feast because that's what it's all about. So our job is very clear. The leader's job is very clear to engage, motivate, and, 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 and help their people do their best work. Wonderful insights. And now let's talk about some of the leadership lessons for the lockdown and then recovery. What are some of the reflections you've made? Yeah, sure. I think number one was don't try to control things beyond your reach. Um, you know, as we came into the lockdown, I think focus was very important. Uh, you ask ourselves the question, how can we make a positive difference today? Um, you know, in times of great and real need, people can pivot around fear. And, and a, an example of that is how we've gone virtual. You know, even at our company, um, before COVID came into play, we had all of this wonderful technology in place to be better virtual communicators. And you would think as an organization like ours being spread across the world, we would have embraced it, embedded it and used it. But we, we really didn't. But in March, virtual became compulsory. So people pivoted around that fear of being somebody else on a virtual call. We don't really mind now if the dog barks or if something happens, you know, it's, it's okay. So we, we show that vulnerability. Um, it's now the direction that matters, not necessarily the time of arrival. So we went through a process of stabilize, secure, reset and thrive. So our first thing was stabilize the business as we knew it. And things were changing on a daily basis. Uh, then we had we looked at securing the business. What what are the parts of the business that we had to really secure? Then reset. What beliefs have changed? And there's been so many things that have changed in the last nine months. So how do we reset to those new beliefs and now thrive? Now that we've we've got that, we can thrive. Um, one of the other things that's interesting is people can deal with risk, but they have a, 
problem dealing with uncertainty. And something that became clear to us is uncertainty is a series of future events that may or may not happen. So are we taking the time to really focus in on the ones that probably will happen and not confuse ourselves with all of the ones that may not happen? Um, let empathy lead the way is very important. Every single employee is on his or her own hero's journey right now. So, you know, that's where empathy comes in. Stay calm, be patient. Um, you know, it's really important to, to keep grounded in calm. Um, an interesting story that I was reminded of of being grounded in calm and, the, and where is a leader in a time of, of uncertain, if you will, combat. Uh, back when we went through the global financial crisis in 2009, uh, I was doing a tour of the Midway Museum here in San Diego, which is a aircraft carrier. And I found my way up onto the, uh, the, to the bridge. And there was a very enthusiastic retired Navy person you know, telling the story of, of, of the bridge and, the, and the, the, the ship. And he said, this big chair that's on the left here is the captain's chair. And in times of battle, the captain never leaves the bridge. In fact, there's a, a, a bunk bed here that he sleeps on, but he spends a lot of his time in this captain's chair. And what was clear is everybody working on the flight deck could see the captain. Mm. So our job as leaders were to be on the deck. This is not the time to be down in the bunk. This is we needed to be on the deck, visible there for our people because we could get we, we can get through this together. Um, another one is resist the temptation to micromanage. I saw a wonderful YouTube um, by a uh, retired uh, general. Her name is Nicole uh, Malakoski. She was a Thunderbird pilot. And she talks about, a, what she talks about is flying loose. And she says, when the Thunderbirds are flying at 400 plus mile an hour, 30 foot apart, and they hit turbulence, they have an agreement that they will fly loose. And that means instead of making uh, sudden moves, they will fly together through the turbulence. She called it um, pilot-induced oscillation, which means if you had different leaders in the organization making sudden moves instead of everybody flying together through the turbulence, I call it leadership induced confusion. So we had to make sure we had an agreement that we would fly loose. Um, use vision to rise above fear uh, was very important to us. And, and we, we call it practicing pragmatic optimism. Pragmatic optimism is not having your head in the clouds. It's looking at the situation with the best amount of information you have at the time. And there's an enormous amount of learning that's happening right now, and we should not lose it. We're all learning new skills and different things. Um, be clear about your intent. There, there is a why behind everything we do. And more than ever, it's not about sharing what we're going to do. It's sharing why we're doing what we're doing with the people in our organization, because that's how you'll get their support. They, they want, they have personal concerns, they have information concerns, and we need to share the why, not just the what. So, you know, these are just a few. And, and then finally, you know, lead with gratitude. Um, we make a deeper connection with people if we enter with gratitude, assume positive intent, show empathy, appreciation, gratitude, respect, and love them up because people need our love right, right. now. Absolutely. And so, so much wisdom in your words. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, all, most of our attendees and most of our listeners and, and those people view us, they are HR leaders. Uh, they are leading the people functioning their organization. So we are ending our interview very soon. So what would you advise them uh, now as, the, as a kind of a parting uh, advice from you as an HR leader, where should they and how should they focus and where should they put their focus on for now and for the recovery? Um, firstly, I think it's about how are we as leaders, HR leaders or any leader, actually going to understand the journey our people have been on. 
So you have to be, you know, more than ever that compassionate listener, more than ever that compassionate, uh, empathy-driven leader. Um, you know, people want to be connected now. You know, we, we are social animals. And, you know, we've been, we've been separated. And we should never have used the word social distancing. It should have been physical distancing, social connecting. Because what we were doing is, is, is separating physically. So do fun things with your organization. We've done some one, wonderful fun things to bring people together around the world. Uh, we had a, a, an, a magician come and do a virtual magician show. <laughs> Uh, we had a comedian come and do a virtual comedian show. We've had a number of virtual gatherings together. Um, our French team did a wonderful thing. Um, you know, the French love to cook. So what they did is they had a virtual dinner together where each member was actually cooking their meal in the kitchen while they were talking to each other. And then they were sharing, you know, the outcome, the beautiful you know, meal that they connected. There's just, these are just a few. Anything we can do to keep people connected right now, because that's where the cultural equity is. And we're draining cultural equity right now. We need to keep topping mm. it up. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's, it's particularly important because HR leaders are also under tremendous pressure. And most people, professionals work harder than ever before. So connection in the organization, connecting at the conference where we are now and connecting people in the organization is vital to preserve the culture. Uh, we shall get through it together. Thank you so much, Gary. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. It's always easy and I could go on for hours and I'm conscious about our time. But, I've, but if we talk about gratitude, well, I'm eternally grateful. So thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your wisdom, how you lead the organization through the pandemic. Thank you.